Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon Hall. I'm coming to you from the northeast of Scotland from Aberdeenshire in my dining room. We are bringing to you today from Dyslexia Scotland and the chair of the northeast branch. We're bringing to you one of our parent masterclasses. Now, this is something we would normally roll out over, over Scotland. We go visiting some of the trainers. They come along and talk to you as an audience. Uh, today, we thought we'd bring it to you online and just keep you up to date with everything that's happening in the dyslexia world. So here we are then, parent masterclass for today. This is the first half of the, the session. This will be about 30 to 40 minutes long. And it's a real sort of whistle stop tour of anything that we can give you information wise. Maybe some light bulbs will go off for you in the time you're spending with your children at home at the moment. So please sit back and relax and enjoy while I give you some depths and sort of points of information as we go along. So the content is quite simple actually today. I'm just gonna really explain to you what dyslexia looks like, how it is in 2020, some of the more updated science and statistics, and how it really feels to be dyslexic. And then in the second half, which will be later on as a recording, uh, we will give you some top tips of how you can support at home and perhaps help the organization as well. So today we know, our statistics are telling us that there are one in 10 people that are dyslexic. So just put that into perspective for you. If you're looking at a class of say 30 children, for example, there are potentially three children in that class that are dyslexic. And I would probably say to you today that there may be even more. There may be more children who perhaps have not been identified or have no knowledge themselves that they might be dyslexic. It's a very, very difficult thing for us to identify as either educators, parents, or wherever we go to get our support. So this, these statistics are fairly high. It's quite a lot for us to get our head around to start with. And the definition of dyslexia is very complex itself. In the world, there are thousands of definitions of dyslexia. And it's very difficult for us globally to agree on what dyslexia is. So as you can see, I'm building a huge picture for you of the complexity of this learning difference. If you take a look at this Scottish definition, I'm obviously very biased, but this is a really nice definition. It tells us, it goes on to tell us, if you want to look this one up, about all the positives, all the strengths in dyslexia. And these are some of the things that we really need to be looking for in our children is all of the strengths and the positive sides of the characteristics. It tells us here that dyslexia is a continuum. It is on a continuum line, whether we can read and write and spell and all of the things that, that we're given to support along the way. So the science is what's bringing us into the 21st century and is really reaffirming some of the things that we've known for quite a long time now. It is one of the most research learning differences, which is quite a, an astounding fact, above ADHD, above ASD, Dys dyslexia is being researched constantly, which is a great positive for all of us, especially our parents out there. We know through brain imagery now that the, the brain reacts very differently when it reads, when it writes, when it's processing information. And this brain imagery is giving us such a positive feel towards finding supportive measures for our children. We know that neuroplasticity has been invented and discovered that we can change the way the brain reacts to reading. We can mold it like a muscle with correct intervention, early intervention. So we're, all, we're on the right road here with our discoveries. We know it's genetic. And that again is a fantastic discovery because we now as parents, as grandparents can look forward in, in, in our children being born, our grandchildren being born and look for the signs very, very early on. So again, another positive moment for us. And then the co-occurrence is something we need to be mindful of. We need to think about is it sitting alongside autism? Is it sitting along alongside ADHD? We don't want this dyslexia to be masked by other areas that may also need support. We know this is happening, another good thing. And there's that uniqueness. There's a uniqueness amongst all of us with dyslexia. We have a thumbprint of our characteristics, some of them strong, some of them needing support. You could take two members of the same family genetically connected and yet their characteristics are so vastly different. It's absolutely fascinating to see the difference in many, many people with dyslexia. 
this wonderful word of neurodiversity has been has come along in the last sort of 15 to 20 years it's an incredible word that is helping us to understand the overlaps of what we're seeing sometimes we're a little confused as to where dyslexia sits is this dyslexia is this dysgraphia there are so many questions that we need answering so let's just look at this wonderful slide here that's been created by dyslexia scotland in the middle sits this neurodiverse person we are looking at somebody who processes in a different way somebody who sees the world very differently and their brain is wired to understand many many different concepts in different areas so maybe we need to place our children in the middle of this diagram here and think we are neurodiverse, we process differently and we learn differently, therefore we need different support. This is an excellent slide, you can find this on the Dyslexia Scotland website, it's a very good, good recommended slide for you. So in my mind, one of the biggest problems and the biggest problem we need to tackle is the way that we feel, the way that our children feel about themselves, the way that our adults feel about themselves. And this word stupid is something that I don't really like the sound of, but sadly we do hear this. And the reason we're hearing this so much is because we need to continue to raise awareness. We're doing a great job. We're absolutely getting there. I don't know if you've noticed that dyslexia is talked about more and more in schools, in homes. If you go for a coffee, you gen generally tend to bump into somebody and the word dyslexia comes up. Yet we still feel stupid because we're not aware of how we learn or what's going on. We need an answer. And these are the kind of areas that we need to concentrate on as parents as well. Okay, so we're moving into a slightly different section now. We've looked at what we think dyslexia is uh, in science, what it looks like, what it feels like. And now let's take a look at the characteristics of dyslexia. The, the strange thing about this and why we're all so confused about it uh, is because it changes every day. You can get up one morning and think, well, today I can remember how to spell something and the next day you might not be able to remember or you can remember the pin number on your credit card as you're doing something and then the next time you go shopping you can't remember your pin number. Dyslexia affects you every single day in many, many different ways. And we're gonna have a look at some of those right now. I think it's relevant at this point to start with one of the most important slides in this presentation, and that is the strengths. The strengths are quite multifold. There's many, many strengths within many children with dyslexia and many adults with dyslexia. They don't often come to the fore until they're a little bit further down the line in life, in primary or in secondary. But suffice to say that you will always find that perseverance and that determination. Many children with dyslexia have to work at least 10 times harder than the person sat next to them that is neurotypical or perhaps non-dyslexic. But that perseverance and, and, and that well-behaved person is something that I've come across on many, many occasions, either through working in schools or tutoring children or friends and family. The determination, the hard-working ethos does tend to stick if we're supporting our children in those manners. The entrepreneurship is, is a great asset to have for some children, all those amazing growing Richard Bransons that we have out there. And that's because many children see things very differently. They think outside the box. Have you seen your children perhaps build um, a, a Lego kit without the instructions or an Airfix model without the instructions? I absolutely cannot do that, but I know many, many children can. And right in the far corner there, we've got a big picture frame. Children like to see the big picture. They, they can see the whole wood and perhaps not the trees in the middle, if you like. Seeing the big picture of scenario is such an asset to have for many, many future vocations, definitely. So 
when we talk about learning and listening and processing, it's about what we see, what we feel, what we hear, to process that information, to be able to retain it. So if you think about the brain itself, and I'm not going to get sciencey on you here because I'm absolutely not capable of doing that, but if we're going to talk about processing, we're thinking about the neurons that are inside the brain. There are messenger senders. And in some dyslexic brains, those neurons are just a little bit further apart. And think of them like cakes on a, uh, sorry, candles on a birthday cake. So imagine those candles are just a little bit farther apart than in the neurotypical brain. This then means that the information they're taking in and processing takes a little bit longer to be able to understood. And then the message that's then sent out also has further to travel between those two candles. This is where our neuroplasticity comes in. This is where we can mold the brain, where we can train the brain to process a little faster. You have to think at this point that actually the processing speed itself is so minute that there are times you would probably never even notice. On other occasions, it might be very, very obvious. Have you, for example, sat to support your children with homework or schoolwork recently, and you've asked them a question and they start looking outside the window? And in your mind, you're thinking they're not listening, they're not, they're not, asked, they're not doing what I've asked them to do, but could they be processing? Do they then, in fact, come back to you a few seconds later and give you the answer to the question that you've asked them? So it's quite an interesting concept to think about, to consider processing speeds. Let's have a look at some of the other areas of processing. So when we're talking about visual processing, we're not talking about eyesight itself. We're not talking about perhaps going to the optician and having glasses fitted. We're talking about processing what we see. So what comes into the eye and then is really then looked at by the brain to assess what the information is. Sometimes people with dyslexia find visual processing quite tricky. So for example, activities such as spotting mistakes in writing. So some children could actually write a whole sentence of the most amazing work, beautiful creative writing, and there may be some quite obvious errors in there, maybe the capital letter or a spelling or a lack of full stop. But because of the visual processing abilities, they may not actually be able to spot the mistakes. So if you look down in the far right corner there, there's a little slide with where, 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 where. So lots and lots of different spellings of a similar sounding word. Some children may not be able to see the difference in those. And that's where the spelling comes in. Can I see what's wrong with that word? Can I physically see the mistake in that spelling? And sometimes they might be able to, and sometimes they might not be able to. This is where the difference comes in on a daily basis with dyslexia. What about something like scanning? We often ask children to scan a document or scan a piece of text for their homework, scan through it and look through for the nouns, scan through it and look for identification of a character reference or something like that. It's actually a really difficult skill for a lot of children. And that would be a great way and a great opportunity to start using highlighters. Obviously you can't highlight textbooks, but you can highlight a photocopy of a textbook. Using a computer, looking at words and numbers on computers, if it's not in the right font for them, if it hasn't got the right color background for them, this again can be really, really tricky. And we might think, well, let's chunk that information. Let's break it into tiny sections in order to help access to that text a little easier for people. I'm just pointing a few things out to you here of things that can be really tricky when processing information visually. Reading a measurement on a ruler, for example, tiny, tiny detail on a ruler, very difficult to do. And I go more into perhaps the later years here, and it certainly applies to me, is remembering where you put things. You might have put something somewhere, but unless you take visual recognition of where you've put those car keys, you're perhaps not gonna be able to find them. And the following directions, it's absolutely me. If somebody gives me directions, then very, very tricky for me to come and find you. So you don't need to invite me for a cup of tea today, because I would absolutely not find you anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> So we've done the visual one, but we also process information by listening. An auditory processing disorder can be something that's very separate to dyslexia, or we can bring it in conjunction with dyslexia. And this is listening and then processing the information inside the brain. What have I just heard? 
What did I need to listen to? How much of that information can I take in? So again, we might have a little delay between the listening, the processing, the thinking, and then the final storing of that information. And this can be shown in many areas such as remembering names. Somebody has a conversation with you and tells you their name, and that name does not register inside your brain. That is a typical thing for me. Remembering names I find very difficult to do. What about when you're having a conversation or a discussion? Can you follow the lead of that? Are you getting the thread rather of this discussion? Are you understanding what people have said? And sometimes again in a conversation, you might find your children just going off in random tangents where, um, and you're thinking, well, we weren't talking about that. We were talking about something completely different, but it may be that they've lost the thread and they've got an idea in their mind that they want to discuss with you themselves. Note taking is a very difficult skill for children to learn. We need to teach it explicitly to them. We need to have scaffolded formula, sort of forms for them to, to annotate when a lecture is going on or a, a discussion or a lesson. Note taking is really, really difficult fine art to learn. Think about, you know, as, a, as an adult as well, perhaps having an interview assimilating what they're asking you. Well, what did that question actually mean? Can we take that in enough and process it to give the answers that they're looking for? And a telephone conversation. I personally prefer uh, to email. I'm finding this Zoom conversation much easier because I can see people and I can see their mouths moving. Um, but a telephone call again, I've got to concentrate, take the information in. It's often very tricky for many people. And just to lighten the, no the load a little bit here, if you like, what about in the mornings when we do actually go to school and we say to our children, off you go, run upstairs, get your shoes, get your teeth cleaned and bring down your school bag. Actually, how many of those instruction instructions do they remember? How many pairs of shoes do come down? How many teeth do actually get cleaned? And I'm smiling because I've been there myself. To remember three instructions in a row for quite small children and older children is actually really difficult to do. And my top tip at this point to you would be to absolutely break it down. Chunk everything you do one instruction at a time. It might mean them going up and down the stairs quite a few times, but it would be worth it in the end. But again, Think about neuroplasticity. The more we practice, the more we build, the stronger the auditory processing muscle is going to get and the better they will be at listening and retaining information. Okay, so we're still on the processing side here. And this is where we're getting into where we're starting to be able to identify whether dyslexia is apparent. And this is the area generally that we will see it more obviously. Our teachers will see it, you will see it at home as parents, is when we start doing letters. We start mapping the sound of the alphabet to the physical letters of the alphabet. We then put those into sentences, into paragraphs, into essays and dissertations. It's a huge code that needs to be broken over many, many years. And this is sometimes where dyslexia becomes quite obvious. Can your children recognize a sound and map it to a physical letter and start blending the sounds together, words and sentences? This is where you'll find your most obvious um, sort of identification, if you like. We then have this affected in our heart, in our writing, in our handwriting, thinking about writing a sentence in an order, thinking about getting those letters in the right order, which we've already talked about. Can they see the mistakes in their writing? And then when we pick up a book ourselves, we really need to build on reading fluency, getting the, the story to flow so we can enjoy the story. We're not always breaking words down. This can be very difficult for many children and people with dyslexia. It's quite a contentious issue whether we ask children to read out loud or not. Um, I think it's individual preferences. We need to ask our children, do you want to read out loud? Sometimes they might read their story to their cat or their dog so they don't feel as intimidated. Sometimes children might read in conjunction with you so your voices are right next to each other so they're not afraid about the word coming up that they don't know. We're building confidence all the time and thinking about self-esteem. If we can't read 
our book to any great fluency, then something called comprehension is not going to sit alongside our reading. And comprehension is really important for much later on in life. We need to marry the two together. They need to sit side by side as we learn to read and comprehend. We need to be able to open our emails in the office and understand what's being asked of us. We need to be able to go to that university lecture and understand what's being asked of us. So comprehension comes with reading fluency. It takes a lot of practice over many, many years. What we want to do more than anything with phonological processing and reading and spelling is to make sure the enjoyment is held in there. If not, then we're looking at issues with self-esteem. And self-esteem is something that we're also going to cover today. It's a vital part of learning. So we're moving on now to another area called memory and the different types of memory that are affected when somebody is dyslexic. And I think it's really relevant at this point to just think about yourself and what your own learning was like when you were at school as, as the parent as you are now. And, and have a look at this sort of image here of a very straight road and lots of curly roads going around it. The, this is really an indication of, of thinking about if you were to learn something in a classroom when you were younger, did you follow that very, very straight road in your learning style, in your reading, in your writing? Did it come naturally to you? Did your learning go along that straight road and straight into the long-term memory for you to be able to read automatically without stopping and thinking? Or was your learning very much perhaps like some of our dyslexic learners that you'll start on the same road, but every now and again, you'll need to go around that circle again and around that circle again to repeat some of the information and, and practice and repetition over learning all the time just to keep getting it sunk into that long-term memory. I think what's really relevant to know here as a parent with dyslexic children is that we all start on the same road. And yes, we have to repeat. Yes, we have to overlearn sometimes in some areas, not all, but with the right instruction and with the right early intervention, we all end up on the same road at the end as well. So that's very relevant. As much as you're finding things tricky right now, it's just keep on going, keep on overlearning, keep on repeating, and know that dyslexia is different every single day, and we will all end up on the same road eventually when they are ready. So the different areas that can affect dyslexia and, and some of the things that we can do about this, one of, one of the first areas is the working memory. And you can see on the, on the brain slide there, if you like, that the working memory sits at the front of the brain. And this is the one that gets very, very overloaded sometimes. It's used on a constant basis, on a daily basis, in the classroom, in the home, during homework. Just a simple question like, um, what is two, two times two? What is two times two may take a long time to process. Think about the fact you've asked a question, the working memory will then act like an echo. So it will hold that question inside the working memory for two or three seconds. The brain will process what it's being asked. It will recall the information it needs from the long-term memory and give you a response. So this is a quick working memory that we're looking for here, a quick response memory. And I've got my picture of my boiling spaghetti in the corner there. And this is not a derogatory slide. This is just to show you how full the working memory gets. The working memory in people with dyslexia is often full sometimes with anxiety before they've even thought about how to ask the question. Sometimes because they know that they've got to respond quickly to many questions such as times tables, the anxiety will cloud the working memory first, which will stop them recovering the answer that they need to find, basically. So whilst they may know the answer, they need time to recall the answer. So my advice to you at this point would be preempt your questions. In a moment, we're going to do the two times table. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you what two times two is. So the anxiety is wiped away, the working memory is wiped clean, and then it can do the job it's being asked to do. What we're actually aiming for when we're processing information we're learning is this wonderful word called automaticity. We want to get our children to a, a stage that they can automatically recall information without having to stop and process and think. So for example, you get into your car, you drive your car, you start your car without thinking. That is a process of automaticity. 
Our children, some of our children get onto their bikes and ride their bikes without thinking. This is automaticity. We want our children to be able to recall information automatically. And you get to that point by calming down the anxiety, preempting what you're going to say, and lots and lots of practice of information. So if you think about, we had a little chat about maths already, we'll talk about maths and, and um, dyscalculia in a second, but again, like in, in a conversation, you know, asking a quick fire conversation and a question, if you don't get an answer back, this is what's happening. So perhaps build the big picture. This is what I'm going to talk to you about in a second. Have a think about what you already know. What do you know regarding the subject before we talk? Give some time to think. And again, this word self-esteem is jumping in. If we don't give people a chance to recall information and remove the anxiety, then self-esteem starts to get affected. Now, the long-term memory, which sits on the side, you can see on the, the top picture there, sits on the side of the brain. This is our library. This is where we store information for life. And we need to make sure when we're helping our children that, we make, that it's basically sticking. We need to find their glue, their personalized glue. Now, one great thing about the long-term memory is this is often one of our strengths. Can you, have you ever had, for example, a conversation with your children where you've been on a holiday uh, abroad somewhere maybe four or five years ago and they give you the tiniest of detail of memory that the, the front door of the cottage was blue or something along those lines and you can't even remember going on that holiday. The eye for detail and the long-term memory for tiny detail like that from childhood especially is such an amazing, amazing gift to have. So use that as one of the strengths and know that your children can store very important information if they're given the right glue to do so. So this glue really comes about by knowing how your children learn, which is called a learning style or a learning preference, which we're gonna have a little chat about in a second. So this really needs to get something stored in the long-term memory, like say the two times table or the letters of the alphabet, needs explicit teaching. And explicit teaching means breaking it down into the tiniest of chunks and finding their preferred method of getting it stuck into the long-term memory. Think of information like a piece of Velcro. We want it in there for life. And we do that by finding some form of personalized connection. For example, do your children love drawings? Do they love pictures? If that was the case, then that may be their personalized glue. So turn that learning into a picture to find a way of sticking it into the long-term memory. And we'll look a little bit about that again in a second. So another characteristic you might come across that you might not be completely aware about is organization. Now I've got a little photo in the corner there that somebody sent in of somebody's bedroom this morning. So thank you very much whoever sent that one in. Um, but I'm not just talking about the organization of a bedroom. Organization is one of the five executive functions of the brain. It is needed by all of us to function daily, to organize breakfast, to go to work, to organize our school bag, whatever it may be. It takes a finite amount of time to be able to organize yourself and organize the brain. What we're actually talking about here is, if you imagine the brain is a bit like a messy bedroom, it's kind of all over the place in different, different segments, and it's not quite know where to go. We need to help our children to learn how to organize. And this may take many, many years. It's not going to happen overnight. You've got to explicitly teach organization, support it and demonstrate it before any of them can really sort of think about doing it by themselves. Some children will be very good at organizing. Some children may need an awful lot of support. So while we're not just talking about organizing a bedroom, we're talking about organizing the inputs that come into our brain, all the information we've just talked about processing. So if you're being asked to do three things at the same time, those three inputs that have just been given to the child by yourself, for example, might need to be put in different areas of the brain to organize. Well, which one should I do first? Which one should I do second? And I can't remember the third one, perhaps. What about writing a story? Have you written stories with your children in the past few weeks? That story is all there. 
children with dyslexia sometimes have the most creative minds and come up with wonderful, wonderful ideas for stories. But it might just be all, all upside down, a bit muddled around, if you like. So you can take that story and put it onto little post-it notes on a blank piece of paper in any order, any order whatsoever. Don't let any of those ideas escape. And then all you do is order the post-it notes. So what you're actually doing is you're taking the disorganization of ideas in the mind and bringing that disorganization out onto a piece of paper. And then the story is in order visually in front of you and you can then write that story in an order. And another area to think of is a sense of time. Now this isn't telling the time. Telling the time can be tricky for a lot of children anyway, but a sense of time is, well, how long is 10 minutes? Mum said we're leaving in five minutes. Well, actually, how long is five minutes? That real sort of sense of a depth of time is quite difficult for some children to understand. And again, we need to make time come alive. And there are various ways we can do that, which I'll be showing you in the next section as well. And I think at the moment, the planning, the organization, uh, the timetable for the day, certainly it is causing a lot of problems for a lot of families right now. And I mean, a similar, similar book to, my, to you, myself here at home as well. And again, we're gonna be showing you some ways to do that in the next section. But planning ahead, thinking about what you're gonna do the next day, bringing your children into the actual planning themselves so they can see how to do it, so you're demonstrating what to do. And, and then they're making a timetable together. So we, again, we'll show you that tomorrow. But the key here for organization is everything to be done in tiny chunks. I think you're getting the idea now of breaking everything down that you say and everything that you demonstrate that you do together. This is explicit teaching. So sequencing um, is uh, something that might be quite familiar to you, but what about breaking that sequencing right down? Think about things like tying shoelaces. Tying shoelaces is actually really difficult, and that's a sequence in itself to do the, to do the string and the bow and the tie. It's a sequence of events. And often for some children, learning something in a sequence, in an order, in a specific order, is really difficult. So you can translate that then to things like the alphabet, learning times tables, learning the months of the year in order, as we're often expected to do. All of these are really, really difficult to do. But suffice to say, if you break it down, you turn it into pictures, turn it into games, then that explicit teaching and finding that glue will start to work by lots and lots of repetition. Something like following directions, following an order of directions, turn left at the roundabout, go forward, go right, take the second right. For me, it doesn't work. So you might find that you need to write that down or draw a picture. And we can even break that sequencing down to writing one single word. You ask a child to spell a word for you. All the letters may physically be there, but they might actually be in the wrong order. And with the visual processing in mind as well, can they actually see what's wrong with that word? Sometimes yes, sometimes not. So sequencing again is practice, pure practice and turning it into explicit teaching by using pictures, by using games. We're gonna to touch on this very slightly, numeracy, dyscalculia. Um, it's very closely married to dyslexia. They are two separate identities. They do have individual identities, but they are very closely married. And that's why I wanted to bring this up with you today. So learning maths is very cumulative. It is stages, step by step by step. You add two, add two, you add two digits together, you add three digits together, etc. So it's very foundational building blocks with maths. So think of that again as a sequence. If you don't understand the first part of the sequence, then adding the second and the third sequence is gonna be very complicated for children to remember what to do. And again, they may remember one day and forget the next day as we often do with reading words and spelling words as well. Maths is often right or wrong. So sometimes it can't be great for self-esteem. We know that the working out of a problem is very relevant to, to maths as well as getting the answer right. But sometimes it's not great for self-esteem. 
And we're often wanting to do maths at great speed as well. We're wanting to recite our times tables at great speed or do our, our testing or exams within a time period. And this can cause quite a memory working overload. So it might not necessarily be that your child can't do the maths. It might be that they need far more time to process what they are doing. It's very sequential. Everything in maths is very sequential. You learn one way of doing things, another idea comes in and it builds and builds and builds. But think about those word problems as well. We have to read the problems and more importantly, we have to comprehend the problems. What is this maths question actually asking us to do? Is it asking us to add? Is it asking us to take away? So our reading and our comprehension that's so vital to all of our learning starts to come in with maths as well. So you might find that some of your children are doing really well with maths in the very early years where tactile objects are used, counting blocks are used. And then when we move up a stage to more sequential learning and more problem solving, that you might find that there becomes a few areas of struggle there. Maths vocabulary itself and the symbols, quite a big thing to take on board. If you think about the add sign and then the times, the multiplication sign, they look very similar. You could get those mixed up just as some children get some of their letters mixed up as well, look very similar to each other. And then the vocabulary of maths, we have two or three different words to say addition, plus, making something bigger, takeaway, minus, subtraction. The vocabulary again can be quite confusing for some children. This is the last area that I'm gonna just raise awareness with you with today um, before we move on to the next section of how to support at home. Um, visual stress is uh, sometimes related to dyslexia, sometimes not related to dyslexia. I'm simply just raising awareness of you today to know that sometimes when children read, the words may move on the page. So this isn't to do with your eyesight as such. We're back again to the processing, what the eye sees and what the, what the brain then processes. So often, and I'll show you an image in a second, Often what happens is when we're reading a page of information where the background is very white and then the black words on top, the brain processes the white first and then the, and then the words start to move, the words on the top start to move. So you might be familiar with a couple of slides that are on here now. We've got some glasses in the corner there with colored filters in and we've got some colored overlays up in the top corner there. Often when we put this on top of the reading, the uh, white glare is taken away and the words may stop moving. So whilst at the moment, while you're at home, we can use colored acetates, we can find different colored paper to use perhaps, um, just to see if it makes life any easier. I'm just gonna show you one slide of what some children can see. Uh, this is the swirl effect. I'm not gonna leave it up too much for you because it might hurt your eyes as well. But this is the swirl effect. This is one of hundreds of different aspects that children can see. But of course, the important thing to know is that they don't know any different until it's pointed out to them. So if you're really, really struggling with reading at the moment and you're noticing that it's the white with the black writing on top, this might be something for you just to have a little think about at the moment, okay. So for now, that's the end of our first session uh, from Dyslexia Scotland on the Parent Masterclass. And uh, the second section will be supporting at home and some ideas for you to use, maybe some homemade resources, and also how we from Dyslexia Scotland can support you. So for now, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to spend some time with you. And I will see you again very soon.